join me in extending a really warm College of Coastal Georgia welcome tonight to our guest speakers, Ayana and Ebby Parsons. So we are here tonight with our accomplished and very dynamic speakers, in part due to happenstance. So Ayana and I were on the same flight to Atlanta, and we were waiting for our luggage. And those of you at the college know that when I travel, I always wear College of Coastal Georgia gear. So there is no question about where I belong and uh, where this college is. Uh, but a gentleman saw that, and we started talking, um, struck up a conversation, and quickly turned to the Lucas Center for Entrepreneurship. That conversation then led to a conversation with Ayana. And it happened that that was a really big day for their company. I'm going to stop there because we're going to talk about it a little bit more. But as I learned who she was and what they do, I was not shy about asking her, could you come and talk to our students, talk to our community? They need to hear your story. They need to know you. And she said yes. And she said yes really quickly. Within 30 minutes, I had an email from her. And she said, and I want to read something from the email. She said, we have dedicated our lives to helping foster inclusive leadership, inclusive governance, and inclusive entrepreneurship. And I knew in that moment that we were in for an incredible treat tonight. So thank you, thank you for those words and for, for meeting. So y'all are in the presence of greatness. I'm gonna read some brief bios because I really want you to get to know them tonight through our conversation. But let me tell you a little bit about these wonderful people. Ayana Parsons is General Partner and Chief Operating Officer at Fearless Fund. She has nearly 20 years of experience as both a corporate executive and an organizational consultant with experience in consumer markets, international business strategy and operations, top team effectiveness, board effectiveness, and inclusive talent management to help drive organizational growth and transformation. She served as the global head of retail, consumer goods, and lifestyle industries at the World Economic Forum and as a senior partner at Corn Ferry. She is a seasoned industry management or industry executive with a career that spans sales, marketing, strategy, and general management roles at companies like Phillips, Pfizer, Kimberly Clark, and Procter & Gamble. Ayana started college on a Division I basketball scholarship. And she graduated summa cum laude with her bachelor's degree in management and an MBA in marketing from Florida A&M University. She is awesome. <laughs> and Dr. Ebby Parsons III is a seasoned business executive. He worked at Fortune 500 companies, including Intel, Medtronic, and American Express. And in 2007, he decided to transition to leadership in education. And he served as the Chief Operating officer, officer of Hartford Public Schools. And then he went on to lead the operations of Mosaica Education, the third largest charter school organization in the U.S., where he managed over 80 schools across the U.S., in the Middle East, and Asia. Leveraging his experience and his expertise in business and in education, he launched Yardstick Management which we'll talk more about tonight. But he has a bachelor's degree in industrial engineering from Florida A&M, an MBA from the University of Minnesota, a doctorate in educational and organizational leadership from the University of Pennsylvania, and he has held faculty appointments. He served on boards of many wonderful organizations like the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra, the Metropolitan Opera Guild, Urban Ministries, to name only a few. And he's a member of the Aspen Institute's Global Leadership network. He is awesome. Tonight is a gift to the college 
and to this community. And I want to say thank you, Ayana and Abby, for that gift tonight, for sharing your time, your talents, and your stories. And I am so glad that their daughters, Noelle and Nora, are here. And you guys are awesome, too. So two special people with a kind of tale of two cities tonight. These two entities are Yardstick Management and Fearless Fund. So let's start with Yardstick. Named the number one management consulting firm in the United States and number 10 globally. So let's talk about the Yardstick Management founder story. I understand that Ayana had the vision, the brains behind the company, and Abby took on the task of doing the work. So Ayana, can you start with your vision, and Abby, maybe you could pick it up from there and tell us how all that work part rolled out, how the company flourished, and where things are today. Yes, I would be happy to, and, and I have to give my, really my mother-in-law, all the credit. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, so my mother-in-law was really the one that challenged Abby to, to do something about it. And, um, and he'll, he'll jump in and, and really tell the story, but uh, he was working at American Express. He was in investment operations, um, had sort of a, a newly minted MBA from the University of Minnesota, and he was reading an article about Detroit Public Schools and their graduation rate and how incredibly low it was. And he was frustrated um, as someone who had grown up in, in the city of Detroit, but had amazing educational opportunities afforded to him. And um, my mother-in-law, Beverly, called him my mom, um, in, in true form said, well, if you're so upset about it, why don't you do something about it? And that was really what inspired the founding of what was Yardstick Learning, but later became Yardstick Management. And to the point around just sort of the vision, I always knew that it could be big. And even from the start, we had the vision of creating a management consulting firm that could help mission-driven organizations, whether those were large corporations, nonprofits, educational institutions, you name it. But it was all centered around helping to create opportunities for those who had been marginalized, overlooked, underrepresented, that was always at the core and the heart of the DNA um, of Yardstick. And, you know, in those early days, it was challenging because we, we knew where we wanted to get. And sometimes it's hard to be patient when you have these huge aspirations and goals, but we had to start somewhere. So, I mean, I don't know if you want to jump in yes. on that somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, Somewhere was starting at the bottom, for real. Uh, we we started the company. My eleven year old here was. <laughs> a, chief of staff. Right, she was a chief of staff at three months old, and we. I think one of the greatest gifts was also one of our biggest challenges. We started with no investment dollars. We started with no no loans, no anything, uh, significant debt. Like, I just finished this doctorate at Penn. I was like 100 or something K I didn't have. Like, I, I either had a, a really good job, but I hadn't yet paid all the people that I owed. So, it was a lot of debt. It was a lot of debt. <laughs> and he was trying to continue to go to school. I love you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I'm just going to say, you know, I'm going to just say it. I was But it was tough. And I'll tell you, like, uh, I brought my daughter up because she was a big part of the inspiration is – we wanted to create a world where we'd be proud for her to grow up in it. And I'll never forget, we, like, I think the first time I got a, an opportunity to speak to anybody was probably three months into the business. We, I was invited to speak on a, on a really like low level radio station that was probably streaming to like 500 people. I mean, I, I think it was a really small number of people, but it was an opportunity. And the nanny was sick. My wife was at work. She had our benefits. You got to think, when you're an entrepreneur for real, you got to think about all the things. Like, mm -hmm. she had the stable job. She had the, the guaranteed income. I had all the risk. I had no guarantee of anything. And I took her when she was about five months old, sat on my lap, and did a live interview while I'm literally 
Try to like drown her in baby in, in milk and <laughs> in toys. So I'm like, there's pictures of me on this radio show with like a little uh, toy to keep her entertained while I'm trying to talk about this company that I'm creating. <laughs> it was crazy, but but I think it inspired just kind of how there's no excuses. Like, especially as a black entrepreneur, it's it's a really difficult start because our business was always very intentional on representing the under, underrepresented. And so for so many years you get, well, people don't care about the demographic. They don't have the money. You know, you got to think about other stuff. You, know how many, you won't believe how many black people told me I was too black. Um, I'm serious. It's crazy. And, and, and it was all about, I, I, I figured a way, I figured out that I need to get into these companies and then show them what we got so that we can get a much bigger opportunity. And so what I started realizing, because I had a significant education background, that I can get in on the corporate social responsibility arms. I can get in on the cost center arms of these big companies. And so Facebook gave us a shot. EY gave us a shot. Like, we built out a tutoring, uh, uh, basically this mentorship program called College Map. They still do it to this day. It's College Mentoring for Access and Persistence, um, and it's targeting underrepresented youth that EY uh, found. And then Facebook has similar programs. And what ended up happening was, we got into these big companies on their cost center budget, which means that they were paying me pennies on the dollar. But what I called it was buying logos. I was like, if I can go tell somebody I can get Facebook, then there's 10 other tech companies I can charge top dollar for because they want to work with somebody who worked with Facebook. Mm -hmm. And so what I did is I started buying logos. And so I went and I got like 15 major companies to give me a shot. And as they gave me a shot, then I was able to prove we could figure it out. And so we, I brought on, and I had to do a lot of math. So if you ever think about starting a consulting firm, the best thing you can do up front is math. And I'm talking about literally I pulled together this crazy spreadsheet where I said, because I couldn't afford to hire people full time, but I looked at what's a vice president, what's an executive lifestyle look like? And so I did this whole formula. I said, okay, if you're, your average executive that's making a quarter million dollars a year how much money is that family saving? And so I looked at, on average, it's, it's a, it's a two-parent household with one income earner, two new cars, a house in the suburbs, kids in private school. And when you start backing out the math, the average quarter million dollar family was only saving about 15K. And so I figured out, I could pay you twice what you're saving, and you're some fancy big wig, and I can pay you twice what you save in a year on a two-month engagement. And so I was able to attract superstars mm -hmm. to come onto these engagements because even though there's some big wig at some big company, they only save fifteen thousand dollars a year. So if I'm paying you thirty grand, that's significant because that's all extra. And most of them weren't working that hard because by the time they got there, they were only really working twenty hours a week, sitting in their big offices. I was <laughs> Like 80 hours. <laughs> right? so, so this was a different kind of person. My, my perspective was how could, I went and found people who were lazy at, at, their, at their day jobs. And, and, and it ended up working out very well because like as we've grown, so we went from buying logos to the logos paying us top dollar. Mm -hmm. So we went from like, hey, can I get a contract with Facebook for pennies on the dollar to now Facebook, we're busy. Um, why don't you call this other firm? And then what ended up happening is we started becoming the big dogs. We started becoming the firm everybody wanted to work with. And so over the years, we, we, went, we, we really doubled down in tech. And so we got all the big tech companies, the Amazons, the Indeeds, the Facebooks, the LinkedIn. We worked with all of them. And then we started getting all the other companies. We worked with, we worked with like Mass Mutual and Prudential. So we re really, those buying logos paid off because the logos started buying us. And they started buying us in scale. And so we, we, we turned 10 years old last year. Uh, early, about this time last year, I decided, I'm like, it's time to sell. Um, I remember I told you all, when you become an entrepreneur, you got to do a lot of math. And so I had to understand when a recession was coming. And every time there was something pivoting in the market, we had to be about 6 to 18 months ahead of it. Because I needed to know what's happening before it happens so that I got the resources in place to be able to be in demand. Because... We didn't have a cap table. We didn't have anybody backing us. And so what ended up happening was we started with management consulting. We started realizing that people wanted to hire people instead of consultants. So we launched our executive search line of business. 
we started realizing that they wanted to find these types of people. So we, we, we basically doubled down before the need came, and every time we were ahead of the curve, which gave us that significant jump start. And so uh, just this January, so we grew over the last decade, and when I say no cap table, I mean we own 100% of the business with zero debt, and that's a significant thing. Because when you talk about exiting a business, you know, you hear all the time, this company sold for $200 million, this company sold for $100 million. The founders gave away equity so early on that on the $200 million sell, they might walk away with $15 million. Still a lot of money, but that's not $200 million. When we sold, Ayana and Ebi got 100%. And so we ended up just a couple months ago now, had the largest uh, black-led consulting exit ever. And... Um, 100% of the cap table was ours without any debt. And so it was the right bet, and we keep making more bets, and yana has got more stories, but we really focused on how do we transform how businesses intentionally focus on people who look like us and people from other marginalized communities and then prove to the world that we can go and be better than everybody else. And, and you know, the people we put in place are killing it all over the world, and we just keep, keep moving. The, the day I met you, Ayana, it was, it was January 20th. So if y'all are Googling yardstick <laughs> management in that sale, it was, it was, I think, that day. And um, bless her heart, she probably thought I was a stalker. Because we talked for a few minutes at the gate and then ended up running into her again when we're getting on the plane train. And that's when we I had literally, Jean was kind of holding my arm because I was doing one of those Googling while walking through the Atlanta airport, <laughs> hoping I don't fall into someone and learning about what was going on in, in this incredible company. But Ayana, you've talked about leading with purpose. What, what does that mean in terms of yardstick and, and the work when you think of leading with purpose? Well, the, the name behind Yardstick, and that came from a good friend of, of both of ours who um, used to work with me at, at, at P&G, which is renowned for marketing, and, um, and it was really intentional. And, and Yardstick, our whole, the whole premise was it's sort of the standard by which others are measured. And, and when you talk about sort of leading with purpose, we always wanted to create and build a company that could become the standard by which others were measured. Mm -hmm. And we also wanted to create something that would be meaningful and impactful and positive in the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why we get up and we do the work that we do every day and, and leave a legacy for our daughters to mm -hmm. sort of inspire them and know and help them see that they can be the change that they, they want to see in the world. I, I got a good, ex I, can y'all hear me? Yeah. I, got, I got a pretty dope <laughs> example of like purpose. So, 2020, May 2020, we just got into like COVID, everybody's normalizing Zoom and all that other stuff. Y'all might remember the PPP loans that came out. You remember nobody from any marginalized background got a single dollar. It was like, it was, it was ridiculous. It was all these multi-million dollar big franchises that were able to get the PPP loans. And so what we had done for so long is we had been able to curate these unreal rooms. And so what ended up happening was the first time we wanted to test out the room in Zoom, we invited like five or six big, big wig executives. And uh, one of them was my cousin, who's the chief lending officer of one of the largest black owned banks in the country. And the conversation was we were frustrated, like we didn't have access to any PPP money. And he was like, well, the only ones who have it in their charter to care about black owned businesses is black owned banks. And so from that moment, I asked a really big question that turned into an even bigger answer. I was like, because Netflix, Netflix is, is basically sponsoring these events we were gathering. And I'm asking Netflix, well, why don't y'all put your money in black owned banks so we can get access to money? And Netflix was like, we might be able to do that. And so what ended up happening as a result of that conversation, I told you this was May, right? we got, just got into Zoom. I think by the end of June, the largest investment in the history of American black owned banks we got Netflix to put $100 million in within not even two months. And what was even better than that is over the last three years, we can directly attribute $4 billion, the largest reallocation of resources in the history of America to black-owned banks happened when six people were in a Zoom. And now we got $4 billion into black-led financial institutions just because we asked the question. Wow. 
Wow. Let's talk about the Fearless Fund a little bit. I think that's a really good segue to that because another really kind of crowning achievement. And um, Ayana, you cited a study that showed that companies with female founders perform 63% better on average than all male founding teams. And that despite the greater potential to produce higher returns, women are historically underfunded and particularly women of color. We also know that just looking back at just 2018 alone, that U.S. companies raised a total of $130 billion in venture capital funding, but only 2.2% of that total went toward female-founded companies, and less than 1% of the total funding was allocated toward businesses founded by women of color. So I just wanted to set the stage for why a Fearless Fund, but I understand that this was the flip of yardstick, that this one was Ebby's vision. And Ayana's doing all the work, by the way. Um, but Ebby, can you give us a glimpse into what those conversations were like as you were getting this idea to emerge? And then Ayana, tell us the rest of the story. So my, my con contribution was more on the idea of Ayana being involved. Um, our good friend, or I, we, I grew up with a woman named Arian Simone. She, uh, she had an idea that she wanted to be a venture capitalist. And she wanted to be a venture capitalist focused specifically on businesses founded by women of color. It was this huge need. Nobody was addressing it. And she hadn't had any money raised yet. And so... Um, Arian was actually pitching us to invest. Mm. And so Ayana thought it was a good idea, but Ayana's hypercritical of everything. Um, <laughs> of everything. Yes. So, so you look for the problems first. Uh, this is a great team, by the way, <laughs> right? But what happened was Arian had this idea, and I was like, I'll write a big check, but I think you need to have another general partner involved to help you co-found this business and I suggested Ayana and I was like look because Arian is a she's an, a force in the entertainment space so she did she did it kind of unique where she got like celebrity ambassadors and all that kind of stuff but Ayana's like one of the most credible women in business in the world and she literally like the like Ayana's understated but all the people we read books about she plays basketball with She's like, oh, Bill. I'm like, what Bill? Bill Gates. I'm like, I don't just call him Bill. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, like, straight up. She knows all of the most powerful people in the world. That's what the World Economic Forum is. It's like the 1,500 most powerful people in the world. And there was a lot of credibility that Diana added to the Fearless Fund. Mm -hmm. And so that was my contribution, is making sure that it had the credibility of Diana involved. Yeah, well, and it was an easy yes. And it was an easy yes when you look at the data, and you, you alluded to some of it. So, um, you know, there's varying studies, but certainly less than 2% of uh, venture capital funding goes to women. And for those that aren't familiar with venture capital, it is for early stage companies. So sometimes it's just an idea that you want to grow and you want to manifest into the world. But sometimes you've got a little bit of traction and people have started to buy the product. But it tends to be all this early stage startup. And what we saw was that women of color, specifically black and brown women, were the most founded, so the fastest growing demographic of entrepreneurs in the country, but the least funded. And when you uh, peel back in on some of that data, mm -hmm. for black women specifically, they get 0.0006% of venture capital funding. So when I talk about the disparities, they are vast. Um, and so that's what we came in to do, was to, to really address an unmet need. And, and we had to raise the money to do that. And so we thought we were going to take the world by storm with what, what was going to be a $5 million concept fund to show and demonstrate that we can help these women, we can fill this unmet need. That quickly turned into a $25 million fund where we invested in 50% tech businesses and 50% consumer. When we look at women of color, they are starting beauty businesses, food businesses, uh, retail e-commerce, consumer tech, 
again, at a much higher rate than any other demographic. And we've now invested in 40 companies. We're raising our second fund, which will be significantly larger than our first. And um, just by, by the sheer nature of the work that we're doing, we're driving impact because these women are hiring other people of color. They're going into underserved communities to start these businesses, to hire the staff for these businesses. Um, there's just a whole sort of trickle down uh, effect. And I'll make sure that you get our very first impact report, awesome. which is coming out um, very soon. That's and great. Speaking of like businesses, y'all have heard of. So she bought a bank. They bought uh, they they, they Cap, yeah. Capway Bank. You heard of Slutty Vegan. Mm -hmm. They're in Slutty Vegan. They're in Hair Brella. They're in all these dope companies, and they've already raised now 100 million because they raised 25 the first round, 150 is the second round, and she already got 75 of that next 150 already raised. So. Yeah, I mean these women who are founding these companies are incredible. Slutty Vegan, um, that's a funny story because when we first uh, started talking about doing that investment, as a very conservative corporate person that I am, I was like, I don't know about this name, I don't, I don't know, um, but Cindy Cole, who is the founder of Slutty Vegan, what she is doing is she's truly democratizing veganism, mm -hmm. and, and she goes into food deserts. All of her locations are in food deserts and underserved communities and she's making it accessible. Now, um, I think the menus over time will change, but the, the beauty of, of venture capital is when we look at a business and we dissect it, if the business doesn't have the ability to return the funds, is what we say. So on a $25 million fund, it means we're not going to invest in a business unless we believe that that can become a $25 million business. On a $100 million fund, it's the same. Um, it's that kind of scale, and we saw that. And you're seeing it as she quickly scales um, throughout the country. It will be the next, you know, Shake Shack. And I'm looking for this this quote. Uh, was it 63 percent of billionaires got their their wealth from venture capital? And it was like I think the the I think it's about the same statistic for, of millionaires from entrepreneurship. So, like, the vast majority of millionaires became millionaires through entrepreneurship. The vast majority of billionaires became billionaires through venture capital. Well, I think the beauty of it, though, is, so this is the other thing that's funny about it. Um, I've never cared about money. Uh, for me, it's never been about the money. It's always been about the impact. For him, it's always been about the impact, but it has for sure always been about the money. <laughs> <laughs> and you, it will, we'll fill that back a little bit. Yeah, well, we have to get into our story mm -hmm. a little bit more. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> okay, this is a good time to say, I mean, you guys are so incredibly inspirational, and I would like to backtrack a little bit to your childhoods. We talked a little bit about very different backgrounds. Um, Ebby, you were a very, very young entrepreneur, and we were both in elementary school. Your story is much better than mine. I was just taking remnants from a furniture factory of upholstery and making throw pillows and selling those. And then that turned into, or kind of evolved to another need I saw, which was taking antique buttons and making earrings out of those. And so I was selling these in businesses in my community as a, as an elementary school student. But you were doing some incredible things as a young entrepreneur. But can you tell a little bit about your, your yeah. story? So my entrepreneurship journey, I was uh, nine years old. The Detroit Pistons had just swept the Los Angeles Lakers in 1989. And my family, we piled into our family minivan. And we get downtown. Like, the whole city of Detroit is, like, just rocking. Everybody's outside with brooms because we just swept the Lakers. And I... It, it, it was, it was something you never forget because um, there was this big white truck. Guys picked up the back of the truck, and it was like five guys working um, and had 100 shirts on each arm, and they were selling the championship T-shirts. And my father uh, kept a few hundred bucks on them at all times, and so he, he asked could he buy it at the wholesale price. And so they basically sold him, I don't know, maybe 50 shirts for half off, and he, he sold them within like 10 minutes. The next day, my father had a printing press company. He had, we, we had a corner. We were the first street vendors in the city of Detroit. And we it was right next to a, a fire station. So we had this big clothesline of all these Pistons t-shirts. And he paid our college, our uh, private school tuition within like 30 days. 
And what ended up happening from that, we, we, we launched Parsons Paraphernalia. And so the Pistons won back-to-back. We had several corners in Detroit. We, we ended up having, like, stores in different malls, like kiosks in malls and then another store in a mall. So it was always about entrepreneurship, so much so that, like, my whole life I was doing it. So when I got to college, I was the calling card guy. I was the guy, if, 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 you, if you got roses delivered to your dorm for Valentine's Day, no matter if you were a Florida State fam, you were Tallahassee Community College, that came from me. Um, <laughs> all while on a football scholarship. Yeah, and, so, and an engineering major. He's doing all of this. Yeah, it was crazy. Like, I was a football, I was an All-American football player and engineering student, but I had two cars, my own three-bedroom apartment. I'm 19 years old. You were in the dough because you had everybody buying from you. I was selling teddy bears, roses, calling cards. <laughs> I love it. What position did you play? I played D-line. I was a defensive end and tackle. That's awesome. So your start in terms of kind of your life, what you saw in your community, because that was so different between you guys and your backgrounds, like where your home and what you saw. And So I grew up in the city of Detroit. It was a, when I grew up, Detroit was 92% black. So we were the blackest city in America by far. Still is the blackest city in America, and it's only 80%. Um, and so when I grew up, I saw black people different from how I think we saw, saw ourselves when I went to an HBCU because everybody was black. So my doctor was black, the mayor was black, the guy that went to jail was black. The, like Your success, your failure, and everything in between looked like you. And so I grew up in a community where my success or failure had nothing to do with like the external community. It was just based on my decision. And I grew up in, a, in an environment where, you know, Detroit is known for, like, hustling. It's known for grit and figuring it out. And so mm-hmm. I grew up in a town where it's on you. Like, either you're going to sink or swim, but that's your decision. Mm-hmm. And so I grew up in a family where we were swimmers. Mm-hmm. Awesome. And, Ayana, your story in terms of your background, small southern town, Hot Springs, Arkansas, um, and you were... Just want to hear you talk a little bit about that and that formative trip that you had to Pennsylvania and kind of what that meant to you. Yeah, so my, I had a great upbringing, um, but Hot Springs, Arkansas was a tale of two two towns, two cities. I consider it a small city, even though he thinks it's a, we have street lights. <laughs> <laughs> Let me start there. But um the reason why it was a tale of two cities is that, uh, on the one hand, the, the town itself is a national park, so it's beautiful. There's mountains, there's lakes, there's a whole um, village that's gated and, and a beautiful retirement community. But the, on the other side of that, though, is a lot of gang violence, a lot of gang violence, um, and, and, a, and a lot of segregation. And so when I, when I think about my upbringing, and, and growing up in Hot Springs, I'm saddened by a lot of realities. So while Evie, you know, had black doctors and lawyers and teachers and all of these things, for me, I never had a, a black doctor because they, they weren't there. Uh, we didn't have black lawyers. Um, you might have a few black teachers, but for me, I didn't have any, any black teachers until I was in middle school. Um, And uh, it was so segregated that I remember testing into the gifted and talented program in kindergarten. And I went to an elementary school called Langston, and it was named after Langston Hughes. It was in an all-black part of our city. And um, all of the students, I mean, it's 99% black in terms of the school. And I lived in the suburbs. And I remember getting bussed into school with all white kids to go to this gifted and talented program that is in an all black neighborhood and an all black school. And that for me was the first time that I just sort of realized this is really backwards. Because you mean to tell me that there are no black students in this school that can test into this program. We know that's not the case. Um, But that was eye opening for me. And, And I'll tell you, my mother, played such a, a critical role in, in my own sort of activism and finding my voice and, and wanting to be the change that I wanted to see because she was the 
first um, black woman to, to serve on our school board. She was the first um, president. And I remember, you know, being a young girl in Hot Springs and campaigning with her and going sort of door to door in our community. But I knew that I wanted to help create a better world because I just knew that this wasn't it. And when I was 16 and had the opportunity to, to go to University of Pennsylvania, to the Wharton School um, as part of a summer program for black and brown students, it was called LEAD, and it stood for Leadership, Education, and Development. That summer for me was life-changing. It was absolutely life-changing. I'd never been on a plane, small town girl. Uh, we had to wear suits, I was so excited. My mom had to go buy me some suits. Um, and, and for that summer, I was in the big city and we went all across the sort of northeastern seaboard. We were in D.C., New York. I met Ken Chenault, who was the, at the time the CEO of American Express, and I was exposed to all facets of business. And that for me is when it clicked, that business could be such a positive catalyst for change and that that was going to be what I would pursue business um, to affect change. So that's my story. So that's so interesting, too. <laughs> so you kind of always had that corporate, like from an early age, that corporate mindset. Ebby was coming more entrepreneur, what can we do, Free. that all the, yes. yes, and bringing all that, that together is really cool. Ayana, I loved what you shared with me about setting our sights on a goal in life. Um, like if you say, I'm going to set out to do X, and you know that that journey can be different than expected. Talk a little bit about, about that. Um, well, well when, when I met Ebby, so we've been married for 16, 16 years. I got that right. <laughs> 17 in May. Um, and when we first met, this will just give you a little glimpse into the story and the goals. Um, he asked me what what was it what I wanted to be when I not yeah, when I grew what up. What did you want to be when you grew up? Yeah. I mean, we were, I was grown. You were that grown. I was like twenty five <laughs> or six or something like that. But um, but he asked me that question, and my answer was, I want to be first. I wanted to be a Fortune five hundred chief marketing officer, and then I wanted to be a Fortune five hundred CEO. So I was sight set on being a, a CEO of a major corporation. And so then, of course, I had to ask him the same question. So then he tells me, I want to be the best husband and father that I can be. And that is when I knew that I had officially met my husband. <laughs> because, because I felt terrible after that. I was like, of course, I was a CEO. And he is an amazing husband and father. And, um, but the, the reason I share that is because if that was the goal, and I was doing all the things, you know, sales, marketing, general management, on that path, um, you know, I have to give him all the credit because he's been my biggest cheerleader and supporter. And he's also been the one who's encouraged me to just be open, be open to opportunities. And, and that's why I went to the World Economic Forum when to the outside world who had seen me pursuing you know, this CEO path, people were like, what are, you, what are you doing? You're leaving corporate America, you were at Kimberly Clark, you know, p and Pfizer, all these places. Um, but it was an opportunity to learn, an opportunity to grow, an opportunity to contribute and have impact. And um, it was also an opportunity to work very, very, very closely with a lot of CEOs of major corporations um, and also come to the understanding that perhaps I didn't want to be a CEO because after realizing all the things that they have to deal with, um, that wasn't going to be my path. But what it did do was light a fire in me to help CEOs. And so I've done that for a very long time now. And then when I think about both the work that I've done as, and we haven't even talked about this, but as a senior partner at Corn Ferry and helping CEOs, and then at Fearless Fund, which is truly creating the next generation of CEOs. I mean, these women, they will be Fortune 1000 CEOs. They will have companies and IPOs and acquisitions and all of these things. It's still arriving there, mm -hmm. but just a different, totally different path yeah. that I never could have imagined. That, 
And I mean, I think everyone here can probably attest to that same thing of having a goal, seeing the way that you're going to get there, and it takes a million different kinds of routes and um, just being willing to kind of go down those paths, right? Yes. See what's there. That's awesome. So I want to bring others into the conversation. Like we could sit here and talk all night because they have so much to share, so much experience um, that we can learn from. But before we bring others, and we want to open it up to the floor for comments, so get your questions ready. But, you know, our college is really deeply get dedicated to this community, um, to this region, to being a catalyst, a facilitator, um, being a leader really in solving problems, whether that's workforce challenges that we see in this region or if it's economic disparities. Um, through education and assistance, we believe we can be part of real solutions. Um, our Lucas Center for Entrepreneurship, led by Andy Noctez, is helping students, see many of them in this room, faculty, staff, and community members connect with the entrepreneurship ecosystem that we have and that's available, but it's not always accessible. So we continue to dream about ways, even in, in my office for the few minutes that we were able to slip away and talk about dreams that we have and things that we can do, um, we continue about dreaming to make a difference. But on that subject of dreaming, I know that you guys have a dreaming framework in your family. Can y'all tell us a little bit about that? Well, I'll share the framework, and then you, you want to explain the framework? Oh, we mean, yeah, so like... It's self-explanatory. So, so we got two kind of formulas we, we created in our family. Like, the first one is exposure plus access equals opportunity. And so, first, you got to know the Lucas Center and, and other, other things exist. You got to have the exposure to know they exist. Then, once you get the access to the room, once you know the room exists and you can get access to that, that room, then you got all the opportunity in the world to choose your path. And that's a, that's a big family forming for us. Exposure plus access equals opportunity. And then the process to get there is something that Yana coined. It's dream it, believe it, and achieve it. Mm, there's one in between. Hold on, but you it, go. So that's dream it, believe it, work hard for it. That's a big one to achieve it. Yes, ma'am. Some people want to dream, they want to believe, but they don't want to do the work. Yeah. Got to work hard for it to achieve it. But those are absolutely family frameworks that we that we live by and that we have benefited from. And we and we raise our kids by. I mean, our our kids are multilingual. They speak like oldest they're both fluent in French. They French and Spanish is my other one. Uh, they, you know, world citizens. Like like we, we believe in like exposing them to everything. So that's why they're sitting okay, no, put your hand down. <laughs> well the young, the youngest ones sleep because the they are so sleep. entertaining. But that's why we bring them to this stuff. Like from the very beginning, exposure has always been a part of their lives and then access. And so now we believe if we continue to expose and give them access, they're gonna have opportunities to change the world. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah, that is that is awesome. So let's turn to some questions or the things that are on your mind. Comments, questions, um, Want to hear from from you? I have a question because they took the mic from me. Can you give him the mic back, please? So we can. <laughs> <laughs> at the um, at the uh, Luna Center, uh, we talk about dreams from where you start, and it's often the case that when you start to pursue it, something comes up in front of you, and the first thing that goes. Mr. How did you hang on to your dreams? That's a great question. I, I will tell you, you know, I don't know if anyone in the room is, is spiritual or, or religious, but for me personally, faith is the foundation of, of not losing sight of those dreams. Because I'll tell you, you know, when we were raising the first fund for Fearless, um, it ended up being the, the $25 million fund, and that's considered a micro fund, meaning small money in, in VC world. Um, there were a lot of no's, like a lot, a lot of no's, because we were women, we were black, we didn't come from um, private equity, we didn't come from investment banking or VC. We had these very different backgrounds, but we had a fundamental belief that... This was purpose-driven work, 
that God uniquely positioned us to do. And I think not losing sight of that faith is ultimately why we were able to, to actually exceed our goal in terms of that first fund. And I know it will be the same for the second, but that, that is certainly what is, has kept me going. And with the consulting firm, I mean, there were so many people. Think about it. When people are out of a job, they consult. And so... You for like the first three years oh, of your life. People were like, you out of a job? You need a job? You need a job? And it's like, no, we are building a consulting firm. I don't know if yeah. you want to talk about that. Yeah, I mean, so for me, I, for the first three years of my firm, I got more job offers than I did actual consulting engagements. Because <laughs> everybody just, it's like, it's the most, I went into the easiest to get into field. You just pull up a website and you're a consultant. Right? You don't even need a whole website for it. So it's the most saturated industry ever. And so everybody was like, you're going to lose, you're going to lose. Everybody's a consultant. But for me to hold on, I, because of my goals being different than hers, I knew I wanted to be a good father and a good husband. And on our first date, she told me her biggest fear was to, to be broke. Um, so I knew we couldn't be broke. Um, <laughs> and I knew she had to eat. And so for me, it was just when you keep like lo losing wasn't an option. And that's kind of like we're both we, we're both college athletes, D1 athletes. I think there's a significant piece of that we, we don't talk about enough. But we learned how to lose and how much we didn't like that feeling um, playing sports and how much we did like the feeling of winning. And so I think when you, when you know you have to be successful, because I didn't come from the kind of family where I can go just like live on my mother's couch or something. You know what I mean? Like it wasn't an option. And so failure wasn't an option. So you can't lose sight of your dreams. You just got to figure it out. And that's why we pivot, but you figure it out. The one thing that I'll just mention, too, with Yardstick, what we didn't talk about is before Yardstick came to fruition, we tried other businesses that um, I call them failures. He says that they were learning opportunities to just figure out what worked well, whatever language you want to use. But there were at least four to five other types of professional services firms that we tried that, that we didn't get traction on. So um, I just want to share that with you all who are entrepreneurs because... Maybe that first idea doesn't quite work. Maybe the second, maybe the third, the fourth. But if you have that sort of faith and belief in what you're doing and know that you have the ability to, to change the world and have that perseverance, because it really takes a lot of perseverance and resilience when you get so many no's and no, 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 Glenn no. Glenn County Schools told us no. Right here. I don't know if I told you all that. But we, we did some homework right here. Uh, bought our first house here in St. Simon's Island like eight years ago. And a couple of community members here were up, up in arms at how few black children ever get access to a black teacher. I think it was like one in 10 black students from Glen County schools will ever have a black teacher. And we came here to pitch. I, was, I came. I remember it because I put, it was a study that was just done before the pitch by Johns Hopkins. And it talked about how the entire life trajectory changes if a black student has one black teacher by the time they hit the third grade. Remember, my wife didn't get one until middle school. Right. It was real research presented it to the Glen County School District, and they told me no. They were like, we'll send a couple people to an HBCU. And I'm like, that's not how it works. So we get no's everywhere. We get no's at home. You know what I mean? And so you got to be able to persevere. Yeah. I'm so impressed. Um, you're coming from different backgrounds, but then you converge. And I hear, I'm hearing the word fearless. And there's more in, underneath that, I think. And so when I hear the, the word fearless, I'm, I'm sensing, how did you manage that, which is part of Skip's question. And, and, and how do you teach that? Because you've got something that's underpinning that, is that fearlessness that's really rare. And a lot of people hit, hit the wall and they don't know how to get over it or around it or navigate it. Any comments? Well, I'll be vulnerable and say that, um, you know, I'm still on my fearless journey. Today, what you're seeing at 40, hold on, 40, you're on 43. Okay, 40, okay. So I'm 40, <laughs> 42, I will be 43 on Friday. Um, so 42 year old Ayana is fearless. 
But I will tell you that, you know, 16-year-old Ayana was not fearless, 18-year-old, 25-year-old Ayana, 30-year-old Ayana was not fearless. Um, so for me, I think it, for me, it came with time, it came with experience, it came with uh, credibility, it came with, um, you know, I love sports analogies, analogies, but putting points on the board. Um, it came with an amazing partner and spouse who from day one is like, Ayana, you're a superstar. You need to know that. Um, he came out the womb fearless. So I don't, I don't know. I don't know if it's a male thing. I, I really don't know. But he, he has always been fearless. So I, I mean, help us, teach us your ways. Because I'm. I mean, for, for me, I think one of the biggest mistakes is people say that life is hard. Like I, I just personally think life is just fun. And, and, and I, I like. I like the understanding of how things work. That's why I never said failure, because, like, if it, you know, she didn't want to go on a date with me. I don't think that was a failure. <laughs> you know what I mean? I just persevered. He <laughs> did. And, and now, it's, you know, 16 years later. And I, I think that's what it is. Like, you got to just, you just got to enjoy the journey. I think there's this instant gratification. You got to, you know, you got to make a million dollars day one. Like, you're not successful if you're not this, you, you know. For me, I just look at, I wouldn't call it fearlessness, I'm just more excited. Like, for, I, I really enjoy the journey. Like, we got more businesses we're starting and, you know, made money, lost money. It doesn't really matter because you're going to figure it out and have more fun. And so for me, I, get, I have a lot of friends and we have a lot of fun <laughs> figuring stuff out. And when we fail, we just figure something else out. Yeah. I also think that part of what's helped me, because I'm super analytical, um, overcome fears, is just having the conversation with myself in my head about what's the worst that can happen? What's the worst? You know, when I have my corporate career, what's the worst? They, I get fired. So what? You go get another job. Or what's the worst that can happen? Um, we run out of money for Fearless and we can't deploy. Well, you know what? I know I have the faith and the belief that I am uniquely on this earth to do the thing. God will make a way. So I, I think that has been helpful for me, kind of overcoming some of those fears and truly being fearless. You, we, talk, we just had this conversation last week, too. One of the challenges she looks at money is scarce. And so helping her overcome scarcity and have an abundance mindset, like it's always more money. Like that's the easiest thing out there. There's a million different ways to make money. You know what I mean? I mean, truly. I mean, we are opposites on that. He's like, yeah, you just make more money. And I'm like, no, you got to keep it. You know, you got to like grow it. You gotta, he's like, no, you just make more. So, yeah, I mean, that was our whole, like, when we were dating, it was like I needed money. I just had to get another job because I get a sign-up bonus and a reload. I have more 40, 50 grand. And, and she didn't. She didn't look at it. And I way. was like, "You're insane! Like, are you going to just keep doing this?" And he was like, "Yeah, I will." I was like, "Okay." <laughs> I think we have time for maybe a, another one or two quick questions. I don't know where the microphones are, you guys. Ask a question. I know you have a. But we live with you. Did I, hear, did I hear you correctly to say you sold your company in January? We yes. did. We sold it to a private equity firm. Okay. And are you still with them? We are. Yes. <laughs> we. <laughs> he, he is. I'm not. I'm not. And how big did you grow this company to? I mean, how many employees did you have? So, uh, we, it, so that's the thing. Only about 25 employees. Uh, we were named, like, number one consulting firm in America. Uh, we, we grew the company from an EBITDA perspective. So basically, we were a 60 to 70% margin business. Um, and that allowed us to have a 10x EBITDA exit. Yeah, that, that attracts private equity. It does. <laughs> it does. But technically, we sold for an undisclosed amount, so we can't share that. Oh, no, but, no, the but the multiple, though, is... A 10x EBITDA yeah, on, a, on, a, on a 60 to 70% EBITDA business with, you know... And are you coping working for somebody? Well, the funny thing is, it's weird. It's not changed. Like, I, I thought I, I wanted to work for somebody. I'm like, help us, you know, make, but it's not. It's not hard at all. It's pretty cool. They've embraced him. Um, and you see how he's dressed. I, I always wear suits, so I'm, like, super dressed down. 
He never wears suits. All of his, you know, colleagues, they wear suits, and he's, he's uniquely Ebby. So. <laughs> Are your returns on your fearless fund meeting the investment Yeah, they, they are. So here's the thing. It is, so we started raising the first fund in uh, 2018. And so we didn't close that first fund until 2022. So that's four years of raising. Last year or 21? Oh, well, then the years are running together a little bit, but 2020. 22? 20, 20, 20, 22, yeah. 2022. So we haven't had um, we haven't had years of success yet, but I can tell you we've already had one of our company one of our companies um, now has a hundred million dollar valuation. Went through their Series A. For those that aren't aren't familiar, they're sort of pre seed seed, um, then Series A, Series B, and so on and so forth. Um, we also have another company that just got a two hundred million dollar valuation. Um, and uh, has, has, the, has raised more money than any other woman, um, which is huge. So we're seeing some of the proof points, and we've got some clear winners in the portfolio, but venture is risky. And so any venture capitalist will tell you that you go into it making big bets, and you know that you might only have one or two big winners and big hitters, and the others will fail, but that is part of the game. The good news is... Um, We've had very few sort of failures um, so far, and we're five years in. Every black woman, they've invested in one, <coughs> one third of all black women founded businesses that received over a million dollars in VC funding in America. Yeah, which is, which is incredible, and, um, and we're just getting started. That, that's also what's incredible, and for us, you know, yes, I'm a black woman, um, but when I look at the data across all women of color, there's so much more that we can do and that we will do to, to close the gaps. Awesome. Yeah. Um, Bowen, would you mind taking the microphone back to Mr. Staples? Hi, thank you so much for uh, sharing with us today. You talked a lot about investing in community colors, in communities of color, um, the business of color, things that nature there. When you talk to execs, um, how do you articulate the value add that diversity brings to a company um, or that investing in these communities can grow a return? Yeah, so we, I mean, we do this every day, right? So, but we got to walk the walk. So a great example, I mentioned we bought a house here eight years ago. Like in the last three years, I started tallying it up. I, we spent about four or five million dollars in Glen County. Just one community we cared about, we decided to spend our own money, right? So I spent, in the last three years, about $5 million down here. And so you walk the walk. When people see you walking the walk, uh, we put on our Yardstick Management Institute. We've done two at the King and Prince. We've done one at Sea Island. Um, and so we adopt a couple of communities around the globe. So we, we're doing it in the Caribbean. And so what we do, first, put your own money up, right? Because that's... People spend money when they see you spend money. And so when you're like, look, I, I'm like, I put $5 million up. What you got? You know what I mean? And, and it's, it's a whole different story because I did it, right, in real life. And then what happens is we help. The question is, well, what's the value of diversity? All you got to do is ask the question, what's the value of all white dudes? And literally ask the question. Like, challenge them. Be so straightforward because that's, that's what they're asking of you. Show me your valuable. Well, show me the business case for homogeneity. Because homogeneous rooms lose money. And you can have 45% more market share, 35% more profitability, and you got a whole lot happier people that don't quit if you embrace inclusive practices. I mean, there's, yeah. There, <laughs> that, that's the line. Show me the business case for homogeneity. Um, there's so much research out there. The, the fact that we even have to still have conversations about the business case for diversity, it is vast, vast. If anyone needs a resource, um, not only Yardstick Management can provide you lots of information. Catalyst is an organization out of New York City. They have so much research on their website that will show you all of the business, case, the business cases. And it's top line, it's bottom line, it's shareholder value, 
it is employee engagement, the list goes on, so on and so forth. That's wonderful. Well, we could stay here all night asking you guys questions, talking. I hope we'll have some informal time maybe for a few minutes when we finish. But I want to just say again, thank you so much for what you have shared with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. We, we are so anxious to see where you go, and we appreciate that you've invested in this community and that tonight you've invested in this college. We just are incredibly grateful. So we, while we exit, um, we're going to move to the award ceremony portion um, of our evening to close out. And so thank you guys so much. Thank you again to Ayana and Evie. That was an incredible story, and I, I know that we are all better for um, being a part of it. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Art Lucas, whose vision, along with that of Skip Mounts, is the reason why we are all here tonight. And I know he'd like to say a few words of greeting and welcome to all of you. Wow, that was great. Can you all hear me okay? Good. Um, I just want to say a couple things about uh, the Entrepreneur Center. We've only been in business a year. And um, it seems like we've been around a lot longer than that. So, I mean, we, we've accomplished so much. The, the group the, in charge of this has accomplished so much. And I just want to thank them real quickly. It uh, starts with the president, uh, President Johnson. Where did she go? Is she around somewhere? Is she, is she in the room? <laughs> anyway, she, she's a great leader and uh, is, you know, providing the overall support and, and good blessings. And then uh, uh, Dean Skip Mounts, uh, who, is, uh, who is a great mentor for this program, and it's in, in his uh, business school, was part of the business school. And Skip has just been a tremendous person. He kind of operates at 30,000 feet as he, as he looks at this. And then I want to talk about our uh, rock star, uh, who is a, like a first-round draft choice. Uh, and she's played like a first-round draft choice. That's Andy. Uh, Andy. There's Andy right there. Uh, she's been absolutely amazing. I can't keep up with all the things they're doing. It's just been incredible. Let me mention a couple of quick things to you. Uh, and remember, we've only been in business about a year. We've already had, uh, we've worked with 250 entrepreneurs so far this first year in this community. Uh, and I, I thought maybe if we'd worked with 50, that would be a good number to get started. But we've worked with 250. 10% uh, of those are students. So the rest of them are people in this community. Some are entrepreneurs, current entrepreneurs who need help and advice. And uh, some are people with dreams and thoughts who, who want to become an entrepreneur. So we already have, uh, and we work with them through consulting. We've worked with these people kind of one-on-one. -on -one. We also have a bootstrap program, which is a one-day program where you come with your thoughts and ideas. And at the end of the day, you have a business plan. Uh, and it's, it's a bootstrap program. And then we have another program called the Accelerator where it's, it's more intense. It's like eight weeks. And by the end of eight weeks, you're, you know, you've, you've learned a lot about being an entrepreneur and the challenges and the opportunities, et cetera. So, uh, but we've already worked with uh, 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 250 people. The other amazing thing is, is we have a, approximately 100 people that are mentors in this program. And these are Many of them are retired business people that have great expertise and skills. Uh, some are current business people. Some are just current folks that, that want to give back. And, uh, and Andy has an orientation program to be a, month, uh, to be a mentor. And it's amazing what they've done uh, uh, in this last year. So we've worked with all these 250 people with our mentors. And that's one of the great successes of this program. So I'm thrilled to, to see what we've done. I mean, it's been unbelievable. I, I, it, it's far exceeded my expectations on where we would be at this point. And uh, it just tells me <laughs> what the possibilities are. You know, when you have an idea and thought, and I've been an entrepreneur all my life, uh, and I wanted to uh, get involved in something that I cared about and, and thought I had a little knowledge of, uh, but I wasn't real sure how to do it in this community when I when I came up with the idea. And fortunately, Skip and I uh, 
over a number of years, got to know each other very well, and I trusted him and liked him a great deal. And, uh, and it just seemed like a good place to do this would be in the college, and it's worked beyond my expectations. So I just want to thank the, the folks uh, that have been involved in this, and uh, I think our, our better days are still ahead. So anyway, I'm, I'm very excited about what's going on. <clears throat> I really appreciate I really appreciate that and we are excited to be a part of the community in such an important way uh, tonight is all about celebrating entrepreneurs and the Lucas Center is all about celebrating entrepreneurs and so I'm really excited to be sharing our first entrepreneurship awards with all of you tonight we had we took nominations for about two weeks and we had over 50 nominations for these awards which is really incredible when you think about it being our very first year and first opportunity to, to hand out these awards in our community. The committee reviewed all of those submissions, and some of them were quite, quite lengthy because as we've seen tonight and, and of course through all of our own entrepreneurial journeys and the stories we've heard, there is no short story of entrepreneurship. And we were looking for individuals and businesses who embodied the entrepreneurial spirit. And what that means at the Lucas Center is that you are driven by a vision, you're resourceful, you are a creative problem solver, you are action oriented and you're solution oriented. And the people that you will meet tonight who are recipients of this uh, first inaugural um, award ceremony are absolutely all of those things. It is impossible to capture the full stories in this ceremony, so I'm not going to even try. I encourage all of you to get to know the entrepreneurs who receive awards tonight, and I'll just give you some brief introduction, and then when I call your name, if you can come up to receive your award. We'll start with the Faculty and Staff Entrepreneur of the Year. The recipient of this year's Faculty and Staff Entrepreneur Award formally launched her business in 2020, the summer of 2022. One of her nominators, and I'm just going to re read this, remarked that she's had the courage to jumpstart her creative, creative vision and share her artistic talents by pursuing entrepreneurship. Since launching, her store has become a beacon for science-themed jewelry and unique handmade items. She has done all of this while holding a full-time job, not only as a professor of chemistry, but also while serving as the chair for the Department of Natural Sciences. I am delighted to congratulate Dr. Colleen McKnight as the recipient of the Lucas Center of, for Entrepreneurship's first Faculty and Staff Entrepreneur of the Year. Thank you. Thank you. award is the Student Entrepreneur of the Year. This, year. this year's Student Entrepreneur of the Year began the school year with the idea, just the idea, that he might want to start his own business to support his family. And especially as he nears graduation and he's graduating this May, he left his full-time job in the fall to pursue his vision and it took him all of one month to start bringing in revenue. Now his videography business, PM Cinematography, is booked constantly, producing short films and video content for small businesses and many of you in the audience I'm noticing. Our recipient started with a vision and an iPhone camera and he's grown his business tremendously as he helps businesses tell their stories. It is my pleasure to award our first Student Entrepreneur of the Year award to Price May.
our next award is the Alumni Entrepreneur of the Year. And for this award, I have to tell you, there are very few entrepreneurs in the Golden Isles as prolific in their entrepreneurial adventures, and certainly not among the, co the college's alumni, um, as prolific among the college's alumni as this year's award recipient. This entrepreneur has built a veritable kingdom of businesses across our community and has recently developed the first major tech startup, Gage, to solve the workforce crisis, not only in our community, but across the world. I am delighted to present this year's Alumni Entrepreneur of the Year to Justin Hinshaw. Our next award goes to the Woman Entrepreneur of the Year. This year's Woman Entrepreneur of the Year goes to a person described by one of her nominations as a scientist committed to breaking barriers for women as they age. Her cosmetics line, this is another nomination, changes people's lives from the inside out and her integrity, passion, and dedication to her business is unmatched. This entrepreneur started her business just before the pandemic and yet was able to pivot and scale even as other businesses were scaling down and back. She's committed to continuous learning, has participated in a number of the Lucas Center programs, and is committed to helping women, women be and feel their very best through her cosmetics line, Vintage Vixen Cosmetics. Please join me in congratulating this year's Woman Entrepreneur of the Year, Jerry Gaetti. Our next award is Family Business of the Year. The Family Business of the Year award was one of the most competitive in this first year of nominations. With family make businesses making up such a core part of our community, it's no wonder that we received so many nominations in this category. I wanna start this award with an appreciation for all of the family businesses out there who live the life of entrepreneurship who pour their time and their resources, their heart and their love into their business and into our community. Thank you, all small businesses. This year's award for Family Business of the Year goes to a family who lives for the service that they provide to their customers. With a promise that you will feel like a part of their family and have, a, and have an exceptional dining experience when you visit them. While well, every nomination that we received this year in this category had glowing praise for the nominees, all of the nominations for the recipients of this year's award included a thank you to this family business for helping the customers feel like a part of their family. This family embodies the entrepreneurial spirit and the resourcefulness and get things done mindset has already made their business a destination in the Golden Isles. I'm delighted to share this award with the whole family at Peter's Backyard Barbecue.
And the final award this evening goes to the Entrepreneur of the Year, is the Entrepreneur of the Year Award. It goes to an entrepreneur who embodies all of the characteristics of entrepreneurship that we hope to inspire across our region. Mission-driven, vision-driven, creatively solving problems, not just any problems for this entrepreneur, but challenging and complex problems. They're focused on action, bringing solutions into reality, and knows that to create meaningful and lasting change, all of our voices are important. This year's inaugural Entrepreneur of the Year began her journey less than one year ago. She had just an idea of an innovative way to inspire and connect and empower all women across our community. Last month, her business hosted our first conference for women with over 150 attendees and over a dozen talented, local, inspiring speakers. Please join me in celebrating our first Entrepreneur of the Year, Anne Goodstein, with Via Connects. I just want to extend my gratitude again to all of you for attending. Congratulations to the recipients of our award this year, awards this year, and to um, send us off with some beautiful closing thoughts, President Johnston. Wow, what an awesome night, and congratulations to the award recipients tonight. Um, I would ask all the winners to meet in the Altamaha room which is on the side around the corner for a few additional photos. But thank you to the folks on campus who made this happen tonight. There was a lot of planning, a lot of work that went into this, and I appreciate all of that work and the support of Art and Lindy Lucas um, for this center. Thank you so much. Tonight we've learned, we've celebrated, and now as we leave, we are challenged to do more for this community to do more for entrepreneurs, and to do that together. Never stop dreaming. Good night.